the guided meditation that we just did, uh, for this is about the third week in a row, that I have emphasized the quality of space. And um, the reason I do this is because, and it's very pertinent to tonight's uh, talk, is that if we are to wake up out of our patterning, a key element of that is to be able to pause and sense a larger space than the cocoon that our mind is creating in thought. So, because we tend to get lost in a kind of cycle of reactivity. So we need to be able to step out. One of my favorite stories uh, that I'd like to open with, and some of you I, I suspect will remember this, took place in India a number of decades ago when the, uh, the English had colonized India and they wanted to set up a golf course, which was, for many reasons, probably not a very good idea. But one of the big reasons was because, as it turned out, uh, golf in Calcutta had a, this obstacle of these monkeys that would go into the course and take the balls that the golfers were golfing around and toss them everywhere. <laughs> And it really, really upset the uh, probably mostly guys that were playing golf. So they tried to control the monkeys. And their first way of trying to control the monkeys was to build these high fences around the fairway. Now, monkeys climb, you know? <laughs> so they would climb up the fences, and it, was, it just did not work. So the next thing they tried was to lure them away from the course. You know, whatever. I don't know how they lured them, kind of waving bananas or something. But, you know, for every monkey that would step away, you know, all their relatives would come and join them in the fun. So in desperation, they started trapping and relocating them, and that didn't work either. It just, they, the monkeys had too many relatives that were into this. So finally, they established a novel rule for this particular golf course, which is that golfers in Calcutta had to play the ball wherever the monkey dropped it. <laughs> Now, they were on to something. <laughs> this is, this is uh, what they might call Dharma 101. You know, this is basic teachings that, as we all know, um, we want life to be a certain way, right? We want the conditions to be just so. And life never cooperates. Or it does maybe for a while, which makes us want to hold on tight, but then things change. And so what happens is that we, the monkeys are dropping the ball where we don't want them to be dropped. And if we're to find any peace, if we're to find any freedom, our job is to learn to pause and say, okay, this is where the monkeys drop the ball. So we can see, you know, all the ways in our personal life, it doesn't cooperate. You know, we, we have losses, whether it's our bodies getting sick, our people we love having trouble, whether we run into an addictive relapse, whether we have a divorce, whether we lose our job. You know, it's, the ball's dropped and we just don't like where it is. And then we can see it globally, how this life doesn't cooperate. This year, um, just the tsunami and... Japan and the horror of what happened with the nuclear proliferation there, just really, really scary. And what's happening in so many places, I'm right now so struck with the, the prediction of 12 million people starving in Somalia, and I, I'm seeing nodding heads. Unless we really pay attention, we might not be aware of children, families, just at a massive scale, suffering. So it's global, the way it just, this life isn't, isn't the way we want it. And the question is, we can't change that it happens in some of the big ways. I mean, there's way, things we can control, but primarily the teaching is, it's not what's happening, it's how we respond. And so what I'd like to talk about tonight is the difference between reacting and responding. So here's the big question when things go on. Um, do we end up, when something seems to go wrong, 
either closing our eyes and going in denial, which I think often happens with some of the, the most um, horrific events around the globe, such as massive starvation. I think something in us feels, I, there's nothing I can do except maybe go online and, and um, you know, donate $100. And so we just, something in us just shuts down. Do we shut down? Or when things happen, when the monkey drops the ball, do we blame? Do we blame others? Do we blame ourselves? Do we lash out? So these are different reactivities that we find are, are common. I often use the metaphor of the second arrow, and I'd like to reintroduce it tonight because I find it it's just so helpful. And in this, the, the Buddha told a parable, and it was basically the teaching was, if you get struck by an arrow, do you then shoot another arrow into yourself? And yet, if we look at the way we move through the day, when something happens, you know, when we have pain in our body, when somebody treats us a certain way that feels disrespectful, when something goes wrong for someone we love, that's the first arrow, our mind and body goes into a reactivity that does not help to bring healing. Now there's a Buddhist word, a Pali word, for this reactivity that's about my favorite word in Pali, (laughs) and it's papancha. Papancha. You can say that right now. Papancha. Papancha. Doesn't it feel good in the mouth? (laughs) Papancha means proliferation. What papancha means is that if I sit here meditating and I feel a pain in my back, some sensations of kind of ache or stabbing, rather than go, oh, aching, stabbing, I go, oh my God, it's going to get worse. This is going to mean tomorrow when I try to write for a number of hours in a row, it's going to be impossible. No, what it's really going to mean is that I'm going to end up having to take painkillers. You know, I did this to myself. It's because I exercised wrong the other day. You know, I don't know how to take care of myself. I'm always blowing. You know, papancha. Does that make sense? Our minds do this all the time. I mean, we are addicted to thinking. We're always trying to figure things out, we're trying to plan, we're trying to worry, to try to make things work out a certain way. One of my favorite little kind of one-liners is, mom sends son telegram, and it says, start worrying, details to follow. (laughs) That's papancha, you know. So we have all sorts of ways that we do it. And I'll just give you some examples. And one is what we see happening politically, that politicians or leaders of different parties, sects, whatever you want to call it, will draw a line in the sand, another draws a line in the sand, then there's all these accusations of you're bad, you're bad, and then it spirals so that, and these are the main things, our emotions and our beliefs keep spiraling till we lock into a position that's frozen and rigid and really harmful to our own body, our own political body, our own global body, the world. So it happens politically, the second arrow, something happens and then it's, you're bad, this economy is your fault, you know, that kind of thing. It happens interpersonally, So someone will say something to us that triggers us, and then, you know, we accuse, then we get defensive, then we runs in our mind so much this annoyance and how we're going to get back. I want to say that not all papancha is equal, because you can have a kind of papancha that you're going to have a party and your papancha is about, you know, who should I invite and what will I wear and what do I feed them? That's one level of papancha. Or somebody can hurt you and you can get into the papancha of of revenge on some level, which is what happens between countries that go into cycles of violence. So we get into the interpersonal papancha of getting back. Boy announces proudly, I'm going to marry grandma. 
father says gently, son, you can't do that. Children don't marry their grandparents. Why not? You married my mom, so I'm going to marry yours. (laughs) And then there's the more serious level of Jake dying, his wife sitting at his bedside. He looks up and says weakly, I have something I must confess. There's no need to, his wife replied. No, 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 he insisted, I want to die in peace. I slept with your sister, your best friend, her best friend, and your mother. I know, she replied, now just rest and let the poison work. (laughs) So Papancha goes into our behaviors. A lot of the worst papancha is what happens inside our own mind towards ourselves. And I, I spend a lot of time on this level, and this is when I wrote Radical Acceptance. It was because of the papancha we do against ourselves that makes us wrong. And we do it, most of us do it all the time. If we're making other people wrong, underneath that we're making ourselves wrong. It's part of it. So we might make a mistake let's say, at work, and then the papancha might be, at first we justify ourselves and justify ourselves and defend ourselves, but underneath we're really down on ourselves. And then our self-judgment takes over until we really feel that squeeze of shame. That's papancha, that's the second arrow. So the healing and the freedom come from non-proliferation just as we did in our meditation, we begin to pause and sense the space that's here. We pause and we sense, let's say we're doing that, that kind of papancha about I made a mistake. We pause and we sense, okay, let me just sit and be. And then we start just paying attention to what's going on in the moment until we come home to presence and then we can respond to the situation that's been created. Not reacting does not mean we're passive. The biggest question I got after I wrote Radical Acceptance was, does acceptance mean that I'm just going to be like a doormat and let people do anything they want? No. Acceptance, non-proliferation, means we have the wisdom in our lives to pause, to stop to re-arrive here so we can tap the wisdom and the kindness that's intrinsic in our nature. We then respond with intelligence, not with the kind of fear-based action. Does that make sense? Let me read you from the Tao Te Ching. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? So let's explore this just a bit more, take it to another level. Because what we're basically looking at, the main vehicle of papancha, of this proliferation, is the stories we tell ourselves. And the meditation you're doing, this practice of intentionally waking up out of the trance of thinking and coming back, is one of the most powerful ways that you're beginning to train yourself so that you're not caught in this chain of reactivity. And I find one of the most valuable questions I can ask myself when I'm caught in reactivity is, what am I believing right now? I find that inevitably when I am looping, and the loop is have these thoughts, more feelings in a certain way, more thoughts, more feelings, leading to a behavior I'll probably regret. When I'm looping, if I can stop, pause, find that space, and then say, so what am I really believing? Almost inevitably I find that I'm believing I'm in some way failing. 
that in some way I'm falling short and then there's fear with that that leads to either blaming myself or, or blaming someone else. So there's different ways that we deal with it. Sometimes when we're in papancha and it's, you know, just kind of what I call daily papancha, we don't stop and do that, but there's not major repercussions. When it's really intense, our mind goes into a kind of frenetic spin that leads to a kind of insanity. We, we behave in ways that barely know ourselves. One of the stories, New Jersey hunters are out in the woods and one of them falls to the ground. He doesn't seem to be breathing. His eyes are rolled back in his head. The other guy whips out his cell phone. He calls the emergency services. He's talking to himself. He's talking to the operator all at once. My friend is dead. What can I do? He's going nuts. The operator in a calm, soothing voice says, just take it easy. I can help. First, let's make sure he's dead. There's a silence and then a shot is heard. The guy's voice comes back on the line. He says, okay, now what? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's a terrible joke. (laughs) I know. What I'm trying to get across is we lose access to our basic intelligence when we are in this chain reaction. Okay? I'm sorry, and forgive me for that one. (laughs) I actually liked it when I first heard it, so... (laughs) So what I want to talk about is daily papancha, because what I'm going to have you do, as I often do, is choose something in your life, some place where you know you get hooked, and you know that your thoughts and your feelings start looping, start, there's a chain reaction, and then you become a small self. You get locked in a kind of small version of who you are. And this is the suffering of Papancha. When we're caught in this spin, this chain reaction, we really disconnect from our beingness. And we forget the awareness, We forget the wakefulness, the tenderness. We forget our our mind essence. And we get identified with a very small, familiar version of self. And the people that come to me that sometimes have the greatest despair come to me and basically are saying, you know, I'm repeating the same pattern I was doing when I was 16. And when we start investigating, It's got the same basic beliefs. It's the same kind of prototype of have this thought, have this feeling, tumble into the next thing and the next thing. Some of you remember this from Gandhi. Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character, and your character becomes your destiny. So this is the suffering, that when we don't break out of or step out of these chain reactions, we're doing is we're recreating over and over again a very contracted form of existence that lacks a kind of spontaneity, and creativity. We're unable to love without holding back because it's so fear-based. So the spiritual path, and there's, there's many different uh, ways this is described, but one way of understanding the spiritual path is to recognize these different forms of chain reaction and keep on recognizing and waking up in the midst of them until we wake up from a small self and really live from the vastness and the compassion that's our nature. Now sometimes there's a misunderstanding that the only people that really get caught in papancha are the busy Westerners, you know, we're the ones with all the demands, you know, if you live a life that, if you're a householder, you know, where you're married and you're carrying a job and children, whatever, that that's, that's of course going to trigger us off. And, 
And I really love the story of Mother Teresa being interviewed by uh, BBC, by British TV. And they were spending about an hour with her talking about her work with the orphans and those who are dying. And then the interviewer said, you know, this work is so wonderful, Mother Teresa, but in some way it must be a little bit easier for you as a nun. You have such a simple life. You don't have the complexities of a home, an insurance policy, the difficulties of marriage and relationship. And she interrupted him. She said, no, 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 no. I'm married too. And then she held up the gold ring that commemorates the wedding of nuns to the order of Christ. And she paused for a moment. Then she looked at him and she said, and he can be very difficult too. (laughs) (laughs) So it's part of being human. This is the way these bodies and minds are designed to have something go wrong. It feels like it's going wrong. We get injured, you know, or we in some way lose our health. Are we, are someone we love um, is in trouble? And, and it sets off this fear response in our mind and our body, our guilt, our anger, whatever, and we get caught. So the inquiry is how to wake up out of it. And I'd like to give you as an example of, um, you know, the basic pattern to wake up out of it is to pause and say, okay, I'm in a kind of spin of suffering to get that, and then to deepen our attention. So I'll give you an example. I find that whenever I um, get a sense of what I want to talk about with you, um, I get incredible amount of opportunity to explore it in my own life, which is why I put off talking about death and dying for years. <laughs> um, but Papancha, uh, so I thought I'd share my Papancha story of this week. And uh, it goes like this. Um, one of my daily habits is to I go, I drive down just a few minutes down to the entrance of the park that I live nearby. And the park gates usually open by 6.30. And there's usually a number of us that are all have the same thing. We all bring our dogs down and so on. Well, about five or six days ago, we'd all get there and the guy that opened the gate, who we've come to know, you know, was late. And so we're all sitting there. We turned off our motors. We're kind of just sitting there. And, okay, five minutes. But then it turned into 20 minutes. And then last weekend there was one day that we waited 25 and another day 35. Well, I started dealing with papancha in my mind. And because, you know, in my mind, my mind was saying, this is wrong, this is bad. And in some way he's bad. You know, there was a he's bad thing. And um, I wanted to confront him. And I kept on rehearsing how I was going to confront this guy and, and really blast him and, or I'll seek out his boss. At the same time, I had this mental fantasy of using my car as a tank and plowing through the fence. And it kept coming back. It's like I would, I'd finally settle out some, and the next thing I knew, I was imagining, you know, you know. And I was really, really angry. It was very much the biochemistry of anger. And simultaneously, I had this voice going, you shouldn't be angry. I mean, here you are, okay, so you're going down. What was I going to be doing? I was going down to the river so I could find a rock and meditate, you know? (laughs) And so finally I kept saying, this is my meditation, this. And I'd start, and I'd say, okay, breathe and be with it. But then I would trip off again into this shouldn't be happening, he's bad, and here's what I'm going to say to him. So finally I got it. I got, okay, this is Papancha. Let's really really see where the freedom is possible. And so what I did was I paused and I really paused and I first noticed the anger and named it as anger and I forgave it. And and I named that because when there's papancha there's often a strong energy there. And if we think it shouldn't be there, like with anger, so many people, especially people that are, you know, think of them on a spiritual path, it's considered taboo. 
And so for me, if I can say forgiven, forgiven to the anger, it's not like, oh, I'm angry and I forgive it. Bad, you know, it's bad, but I forgive it. It's just, let it, it's okay that it's here. This is another weather system. So that was the first step, is creating some space and forgiving that the anger was there and then letting it rip, just feeling it in my body, but not going off in the thoughts. I kept coming to the body, to the intense feeling of explosiveness and heat, that pressure, that was anger for me, until I felt it fully enough that I found underneath it was fear. Then I asked, well, what am I believing? And what I was believing was, because he's late, I don't have enough time, I'm not going to have enough time to do what I need and get to work, and it's going to affect my whole day and it's ruined my life. (laughs) It was that kind of a... Anyway, it was that kind of a belief that I don't have enough time and this is going to ruin my life. And even under that, that I was going to fail. It's that if I don't have enough time, I won't finish writing this book and I'm going to fail, I'm going to let myself down, I'm going to let the world down, you know, that kind of thing. It was really good to see that because then I could bring some kindness, some real kindness to the fear. And as soon as kindness or compassion opens in us, we start finding a space where we start coming home to who we are. This is the value of stepping out of papancha. We step out of the identity of a small self and come back to the presence and kindness that is who we are. As it turns out, I did talk to him, and I, you know, my intention was very clear just to say, what's up, and, you know, 6.30, we're all waiting, possible to get back on schedule, and he was a, a new guy. He was covering for someone else, and he explained that he actually had been a little confused. He thought it was o- it opened later, but he would do the best he could, and he apologized. It was all nice. Um, I ended up talking later to a friend who actually manages the park, and he also was apologetic, but then he told me, the park actually opens at 7. This was just a courtesy. <laughs> So then I got to apologize. (laughs) So, um, but what's relevant in the story and what I really wanted to share with you is that the beauty of this message from the Tao Te Ching, can we wait? I mean, can we pause in the midst and wait just with presence until something that is more pure, more awake, more wise can move through us? Because if we can begin to do that in everyday papancha, we're beginning to shift the consciousness that really affects our globe. The same mechanism that would have had me be somewhat nasty with this guy is the mechanism that is part of the cycle of war and violence. Does that make sense? And this is where we can actually make a difference. I suspect there's not one of us here that can't identify some reactive pattern that we could wake up in a little more and find that light of awareness shining through a little more, a little more coming home to who we really are. And that's a gift. So here's something that is important that I want to emphasize. There will be times that you'll be in the middle of your pattern and you'll say, okay, I remember that papancha word, you know, pause. And you might note, okay, I'm really angry, and then go right back in and never come back that round. You still, it's like this bucket where you're putting little drops of water in. You're still filling the bucket of mindfulness. It will eventually overflow, and you can trust that. Every time you interrupt a pattern, and there's even a glimmer of presence, even a little bit of remembrance that even presence is possible, you are beginning to alter that neural network that can be so rigid that we can do decades in the same, in the same behaviors. You're making a difference. Just pausing, just even naming what you're noticing and wishing you could be more present. It, it makes a difference. 
the longer you can pause, the more, just in that length of a pause, you know how Pema Chodron says, just staying, just staying. The longer you stay, the more your natural presence will begin to naturally present itself. Your attitude with, to what's going on, just the way I said forgiven, forgiven, opens up space. This is a, a poem from the poet Kaviri. There's a monkey in my mind, swinging on a trapeze, reaching back to the past or leaning into the future, never standing still. Sometimes I want to kill that monkey, shoot it square between the eyes so I won't have to think anymore or feel the pain of worry. But today, I thanked her, and she jumped down straight into my lap, trapeze still swinging as we sat still. So when you're in that chain reaction and you find there's some strong energy, obsessive thinking, fear, guilt, just to pause and name it, forgiven, forgiven, or thank you. You know, I appreciate, there's, there's some adaptive reason every part of us is presenting. It's just not adaptive anymore. Thank you. It's okay. Forgiven, forgiven. There's a natural space that opens up that frees that energy. It can then relax back. We come home some. So let's practice a little. Let's try this piece out and then we'll just explore one more element of this. So as you, as you come into stillness, remind you of uh, Viktor Frankl's wisdom. He says, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. And in that space is your power and your freedom. So as you sit, as you become still, you can take some moments to just notice if there's some pattern in your life that wants your attention. If there's one of these areas of papancha that, that creates suffering for you. And it could be something that happens in a relationship with another person where you get reactive and you either pull back and shut down or you get more aggressive. Could be an addictive patterning where you act out and then turn on yourself. Something at work, something in the way you relate to work or get overwhelmed. So this is somewhere where the monkey drops the ball, somewhere you don't like, and it triggers off something. The more you can put yourself into the situation in your mind's eye and imagine what it's like, the more you'll be able to realistically explore what it would be like to pause. So if this is like a movie, just to bring it to the frame where you really feel tripped off, If there's another person involved, see their face and hear what they're saying. Feel what's going on in your body when it's happening. And at your own pace, just sense that you can identify this. Okay, this is suffering. This is the suffering of Papantra. Everyone has this. And this is an opportunity to pause. That you have the freedom to make as big a pause as you want right now. You have the freedom to ask yourself, well, what am I believing when this is going on? 
about myself or about how others are relating to me. This isn't like a a really mental, cognitive investigation, just sense of something naturally presents itself, that maybe you're believing that you're inadequate or not loved, that it's going to be too much and you're going to be overwhelmed and not handle things. Whatever you find, Just sense what is going on in your body and your heart and see if you can offer acceptance or forgiveness or compassion, some form of kindness to whatever is going on. For some, if it's helpful to put your hand on your heart as a way to really connect. There's so much evidence that just contacting ourselves in in a genuine, direct way makes such a difference. What would happen if you paused and you felt what was going on and you just said, okay, it's okay, or forgiven, forgiven, or yes. You're not giving permission to the thoughts to loop, but to your heart to feel what it feels. You might sense as you deepen presence the shift in your own experience of your own being rather than the small self caught in reactivity. And for these next few moments you might imagine what would happen if you could pause and touch your own presence and respond from a place of inner freedom and wakefulness, intelligence, kindness. Just a a note on these guided reflections. Uh, For me, when I was processing my anger, um, I would have just barely skimmed the surface in this amount of time. I mean, I I would have still been driving my car through that, you know, (laughs) gate. So if you found that you didn't have the time to dip in uh, and really, really access full presence, please know that this this is the template. And this is really a life practice where you begin more and more to identify the places where you know you're living in a trance, you're caught in a reactivity. And I would invite you as you leave tonight just to pick one area perhaps this week and just know this is going to be kind of an adventure to see how much is it possible to remember to pause and even just a little bit begin to touch a larger space of presence. Now, the main way that we wake up out of this papancha is just what I'm saying, just pausing, deepening presence. We can also actively look to see the goodness within ourselves and others. And I want to just offer this as the last part of the evening. First, a story. This is Catherine Ingram. She writes, a few years ago, I was with a close woman friend in a grocery store in California. As we snaked along the aisles, we became aware of a mother with a small boy moving in the opposite direction and meeting us head on in each aisle. 
The woman barely noticed us because she was so furious at her little boy who seemed intent on pulling items off the lower shelves. As the mother became more and more frustrated, she started to yell at the child and several aisles later had progressed to shaking him by the arm. At this point, my friend spoke up. A wonderful mother of three and founder of a progressive school, she had probably never once in her life treated any child so harshly. I expected my friend would give this woman a solid mother-to-mother talk about controlling herself and about the effect this behavior has on a child. Braced for the confrontation, I felt a spike in my already elevated adrenaline. Instead, my friend said, What a beautiful little boy. How old is he? The woman answered cautiously, He's three. My friend went on to comment about how curious he seemed and how her own three children were just like him in the grocery store, pulling things off shelves, so interested in all the wonderful colors and packages. He seemed so bright and intelligent, my friend said. The woman had the boy in her arms by now, and a shy smile came upon her face. Gently brushing his hair out of his eyes, she said, Yes, he's very smart and curious, but sometimes he wears me out. My friend responded sympathetically, yes, they can do that. They're so full of energy. As we walked away, I heard the mother speaking more kindly to the boy about getting home and cooking his dinner. We'll have your favorite, macaroni and cheese, she told him. I love this story for on several levels, and one is how her friend, the school teacher, could have shamed this woman and really just brought up defendedness. And that would have been another form of papancha, her own reaction, her need to speak her truth. But instead, she saw this woman's vulnerability, she saw this child's goodness, and she spoke to that. She had that wisdom to ju- and that spaciousness to speak from that presence. And then also from the perspective of the mom. How many of us, whether or not we're parents or partners or in relationship with friends, have been irritated and have found that if we can just remember, just pause and remember the goodness of that person, who they really are, their intention, their sweetness, the fact that they too want to love and be loved, how radically we would step out of our pattern of papancha and into a place of loving. That that's the key to that. Nelson Mandela says, it never hurts to think too highly of a person. Often they become ennobled and act better because of it. So this feels like just as the way of mindfulness and presence can wake us up out of um, our patterns, this intention to pause and sense in ourselves, okay, the goodness that's here. You know, I'm, af- I'm afraid that if this keeps going, if this guy is late, then I will lose time and I'll fail. But what's underneath that is a real desire to c- be creative, to express, to be helpful to see the goodness that's there. It's always there in ourselves and each other. A closing, uh, as a closing sharing, I got an email uh, today from a woman who lives in Uganda who made a trip to Rwanda the other weekend. This is what she said. While well, in Kigali, I visited the Genocide Memorial Center. It was extremely moving, and a quote engraved on a plaque in the memorial struck me, so I wrote it down. If you knew me, and you really knew yourself, you would not have killed me. This is written by one of the genocide survivors who lost, you know, friends and family more than I can name. If you knew me, and you really knew yourself, you would not have killed me. Any moment that we're caught in reactivity, that we pause, is a moment where we start coming home to know who we really are again, and we have the eyes to see who the other is. And then we don't act in ways that cause harm. 
whether the small ways we act to create separation are the ways that we act to really cause uh, deep, deep suffering. So we'll close um, with just the simplicity of uh, just a short closing meditation, if you will. What really most allows us to step out of these chain reactions is this longing we have to wake up and to live from our own fullness, our fullness of heart and awareness. So it's really that longing. So I invite you to again just revisit that uh, place that you touched into where you know you get caught in trance. And just to feel your own intention as part of closing tonight in the Bodhisattva aspiration it said like this may these circumstances awaken my heart and mind. This is a part of the aspiration of awakening beings. May these circumstances, whatever they are May these circumstances serve to awaken this heart and mind. To feel your own sincerity, to feel your own goodness of being, to feel the presence that's right here, this wakefulness, this tenderness, 